Okay, good. So uh, well, welcome everybody to tonight's Spence Talk 101. Um, we've got uh, a fantastic speaker tonight. Um, but if we just recap a little bit, uh, this is all about COVID-19, about lockdown. Um, as I said last week, uh, here in England, we're starting to come out of lockdown. We're getting um, more and more confidence to be able to go out and, and, and restart work um, and restart socialising as we hear that the, uh, the pubs um, are going to open um, on the 4th of July and we are also allowed uh, to have our hair cut. Um, so uh, pubs and uh, barbers. Um, unfortunately at the moment, and uh, I think uh, Boris is going to get quite a bit of stick for it, the, uh, that the females uh, are, are not having the same sort of uh, openness. Um, so uh, tonight's um, Bench Talk uh, is, 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 is a sore maker. Um, but we're not really going to hear about him. We're going to hear about um, the history of, of, of Henry Diston. Um, so if we think about what we've done so far, the first um, speaker that we had on Bench Talk was um, uh, a saw maker and plane maker and probably makes lots of other things as well um, with Jim. Our second um, speaker was a plane maker um, um, where we've got Richard Arnold. And then our third speaker was a plane maker as well, okay, uh, with Bill, um, Bill Carter. And then we had a saw maker. We had a fantastic talk from Shane. Um, and so I thought to, to level up the odds a bit here, we, we, we could do with another um, saw maker, um, but also to sort of um, hear really what Diston was about, because I know that, uh, you know, some people get uh, sort of a bit touchy about the name Diston, as, we, as we've heard. Um, so this is really about the history of, of Diston and, and, and what we're doing here. So I, I first met Mark um, at the um, European Woodworking Festival. Um, it's a European woodworking show um, over at Temple, Temples and Crescent Barns. Um, and he came uh, with a pair of his brand new D8s, um, that he, he had just made and ready to send to the market. A absolutely fantastic looking things. Um, and then l l um, luckily last year we persuaded him to come into London and he gave us a talk all about, um, well he didn't give us a talk, he actually well, he gave several talks at the show, but he gave a whole course about saw sharpening. Um, and whilst he was on that course, he, he started um, speaking away about the history of, of Diston. And, and I tell you what, I was absolutely captivated by it. So rather than me saying any more, um, I'm going to pass you over to, to, uh, to Mark um, uh, now. So what I suggest you do is that you all stay on um, mute, okay? Um, and that what you do is you, you click on um, speak of you, because then that means that you will see Mark in his, his full glory, um, seeing his rather fancy shop there. Um, and, uh, you, you know, you'll get to enjoy it. Now, I know that Mark's going to be really technical with us tonight, and he's going to show a, a, a PowerPoint slideshow, um, and, and we're going to hear a bit of a monologue to start with, um, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. So, Mark Harrell, welcome to uh, Bench Talk 101. You need to unmute yourself, Mark. There we go. All right. Thank you, Sir Jeffrey, very much for inviting me on board. Derek. Good to see you and all my friends, Ian, Kat. Good to see you here, Kat, and uh, others. Uh, wow, thank you for attending. Um, yeah, we're gonna hear about the, the story of Henry Diston. It's the ultimate immigration story, the ultimate American story, the, the ultimate American entrepreneur story. And it means a lot to me. I found out fairly recently taking one of those stupid 23andMe Ancestry.com tests, I, I found out that I was about 98.6 white boy from England and Wales and Ireland for the most part. So, you know, you're looking at your American cousin right here. And of course, Henry Diston was born in your country in Tewkesbury, 1819. And what I would like to do is tell you his story, how it's motivated me as a sawmaker, not so much on that as much as his story, but it's incredibly inspiring. And so what I thought I would do first is uh, read to you a narrative that I wrote. Hold on just a second. I got to share the screen. Read to you a narrative that I wrote that I actually posted on our website where we sell our D8 saws. You can't go on eBay without seeing a distant D8 panel saw. There we go. Everybody see that okay? 
All right, very good. So I'm going to read to you a narrative first of something that I've written, a piece of historical fiction, and that's going to be part one. Part two will consist of the balance of the Henry Disson story where I leave off from the historical fiction narrative, which is how young Henry Diston sold his first saw. So with that in mind, I just want you to put yourself back uh, well over a century and a half ago when things were made out of leather and canvas and brass and iron and steel. There was no plastic in the world. None of that existed. It was a time when cold dust settled in a fine mist over the, the London cityscape. And you could see the fog rolling in from the, from the, from the Thames River. And just put yourself back in that time, the smell of fish on the wharves, the creak of an old wooden sailing vessel making a transatlantic voyage, okay? We're talking about a time when communication moved at the speed of a horse, when a letter crossing the ocean could take upwards of two and a half, three months to get there from recipient to recipient, a time where craft superseded technology, um, hey, uh, keep it down, please. When craft superseded technology. And it was at this time in America, not too long after British Redcoats burned down the White House in 1812, and uh, President Madison, our fourth president, had to flee Washington, D.C. in flames with his wife, Dolly. It wasn't too much longer after that. It was only about, what, 28 years after that, that this story begins when Henry Diston sold his first saw. So just picture that for a moment. Early in American history, and a young British kid just scrapping, trying to make a living for himself, all right? That's the time that we're in. That is the setting. Here we go. Philadelphia, spring, 1840. A thin, determined youth of 21 carted a heaping pile of coal from the Delaware River docks along the mile-long trek to the basement hovel of his tenement on 21 Bread Street. The strong jaw set and jutting forward in the breeze like Captain Ahab seeking a whale. The crimson flush of blood pulsating beneath the white pallor of his skin towered a wiry physique, tempered by hand planing boards flat, lifting and storing metal blanks and lumber throughout the day, hammering metal into proper tension on a live anvil. He wiped his grimed smudged face with the sleeve of a well-worn linen shirt, promising himself, God willing, that for the first time in two weeks, he would actually bathe that night. He was a sawmaker. He was a very young and very determined sawmaker on a mission that would see him either flourish in his chosen trade or seeking employment laying track for the new railroad out west. He paused at the thought, breathing heavily, sweat pouring into his eyes, pondering. Then he shook his head with a snort and continued powering the mountain of coal on his wheelbarrow through the awful littered streets of Philadelphia. British by birth and American citizen by destiny, seven years previously, a 14-year-old Henry Diston stared in horror as his father convulsed with a stroke and died before his very eyes not three days after arriving in Philadelphia with his father and older sister Marianna on board the ship that had spirited the family members from Derby, England to the former colonies now known as the United States. His father's abrupt death at the docks and loss of income that was to have been generated through the sale of a lace machine stranded the orphans in a new country with no return trip in sight. Mariana's main imperative in life was to quickly find a husband and young Henry's to find employment. Now it was seven years later. Henry's apprenticeship with a struggling saw shop that had run its course into bankruptcy, and he was determined to beat his former countrymen at their own game. Arriving at his spare lodgings, Henry dumped the coal onto a tarp next to the clay furnace he'd built the week before, swept back a shock of thick brown hair, and considered the week ahead of him, replete with the kind of tasks that sent most young men into despondency and retreat. Fire up the furnace, temper the plate, cut the teeth, grind the taper, and hammer tension and set the tooth line, followed by sharpening to joint. Then he would mill the fasteners, cut the handle to rough form and rasp an elegant contour to final shape, lacquer them, then bolt the handle onto a finished saw. He 
he had the next five days to make 12 of them because he was no longer just an apprentice who had surpassed his former masters. He was hungry and he had to eat. The week flew by in a series of 16, 18, 20 hour work days, a bore of metal ringing in his ears, rasping wood and screeching files. Then it was Saturday. He paused to take stock of the sheer audacity of what he had accomplished, his malnourished body humming along on pure adrenaline, a pint of beer, a crust of bread, and a stout supply of black Jamaican coffee, his only luxury. Henry loaded his product into the wheelbarrow and without missing a beat, shrugged on his cleanest dirty shirt, buffed his brass shoe buckles, and off he went, carting his dozen hand saws while dodging the horse droppings through the downtown cobblestone streets of Philadelphia, the purported city of brotherly love. A pre-Civil War cacophony of fishmongers flinging the day's catch from cart to ice pack to shells for passerbys to inspect. The ringing staccato of blacksmith hammers and coopers stretching metal bands over barrel staves, their product bound for the whiskey making trade in faraway Kentucky. Peddlers and tinsmiths jostling their carts beside them, plowing their own goods through the competitive fray of the boulevards. Saturday morning in 1840, Philadelphia presented a chaotic, noisy, and entrepreneurial dance of 19th century cutthroat competition. Back in a time when communication traveled at the speed of a horse and street disputes were settled through bare knuckled combat. Young Sawmaker found his destination in a tall three story structure on the south side of Market Street, Bowlby and Weaver's hardware store. Henry flagged down a boy and tossed him a penny to watch his cart before slicking back his hair and mounting the steps two at a time, his mind racing. Old Billy Weaver, the proprietor, was a cranky old fart who had scoffed at Lindley Johnson and Whitcraft saw manufactory not 18 months ago where Henry had apprenticed. Billy had strolled into the shop like he owned the place, all but sneering at their product line. Henry watched out of the corner of his eye while tensioning a saw plate with mixed success, realizing immediately that Billy was right. American saws couldn't compete against those made by their first file masters across the pond and were forced as most fledgling American saw makers were to import British steel and their second class metal at that, which is exactly why Henry took it upon himself to master the art of tempering. He frowned, unsure whether to reveal his secret to the hardware stores upon which he had set his sights, Billy Weavers in particular. All the best carpenters and furniture makers in town bought their wares from that tough old boot it was always muttering, quality sells, damn it, quality sells. Henry allowed himself a tight grin. No, he had something else in mind altogether to set that old codger straight. Sudden memories flashed through his mind, highlighting the journey he had undertaken to this very moment. A bead of sweat formed between his shoulder blades and trickled down the small of his back, sending a shiver up his spine. Young Henry shook his head, inhaling deeply. Worry, always an unexpected gut punch. He willed the momentary self-doubt away, knowing perfectly damn well that he had made what he had made and what his saws were worth. That two-word phrase, quality sells, had become the young sawmaker's mantra, getting him through that tough initial period when he parted ways with LJ and W. It had taken him one entire week alone to build the clay oven in the sparse patch of dirt behind the slum where he lived, his thin frame laboring on watered-down beer and lentil soup he'd warmed up on an alcohol burner. The basic materials were the easiest to source because LJ and W were too poor of a business to pay him in wages due. They had been more than generous with quarter sawn beech and apple, the brass rod he'd need for milling fasteners, mild steel for saw backs, and second rate plate blanks from England that he'd have to retemper. That alone was the real trick many sawmakers never figured out how to change imperfect metal into something that outperformed other saws. First came the heat treat in the oven, followed by a rapid quench at just the right moment. Then grinding, scrubbing, cleaning, tensioning, and finally, a saw plate. The hours Henry spent in his backyard, saw manufactory, quickly blurred into days, days into a week, then another and another. By his fourth week, he had the tasks worked out, a rhythm established, and a stack of 12 saws ready for old Billy's scowling review. His mind now back in the space where he wanted it, Henry grinned and pushed open the heavy oak timbered door to Bulby and Weaver's a cheery brass bell announcing his entrance with a sharp clang. A wiry old man in his fifties with a beaked nose and fringe of white hair hanging over his ears and collar popped over the counter, reminding Henry of a rooster spotting a fat grub in a moon over the pile. 
you, the old man barked in a nasal Yankee accent, Henry found pushy and abrupt. Americans were always in such a hurry. Then he grinned, and now I'm one of them, he thought, and his grin broadened. So, Henry popped back smartly, remembered his old Eaton schoolmaster. His left hand found the corner edge of a stout oak countertop running the length of the store. Well, I ain't got all day, boy. You here to look at another saw? Maybe buy one this time? Yes, sir. Henry glanced at the boy, watching his wheelbarrow outside, then returned his gaze to a gleaming row of the most prominent saw works on the wall above Billy Weaver's bald head. Groves and Sons, Spear and Jackson, Garlic and Sons. His eyes widened, and he hitched in a breath. Only your best, sir, if you please. An eight-point crosscut should fit the bill quite nicely. The old man plucked one down and marched around the counter, thumbing the plate with a resounding twang. Henry took the saw in his calloused hands. Two dollars, young man, for this fine spear in Jackson. That's not a cent less. You'll find none finer. Sheffield steel, that is. Henry flexed the saw, finding the tension where he knew it had a loose spot in the plate from his earlier visit the week before. Old Billy squinted at him. Well, oh, never mind. A youngster like you can't afford that kind of saw anyway. What was I thinking? He reached out to grab it back. Turning away, Henry held the saw up to the light, eyed the countertop on his left, then with a flash of his arm, whacked the plate over the hard corner edge. The ringing sound of poorly tempered metal snapped in the air like a crack in the Liberty Bell, and the toe half of the plate clattered onto the floor. Billy Weaver's eyes popped open, and he sputtered a string of obscenities. What in God's name did you just do? What the hell, boy? Diston, Mr. Weaver, if you please, sir. My name is Henry Diston. I don't give a good goddamn what the hell your name is, boy. Henry waved at the lad outside his cart in the wheelbarrow, in which Henry had crafted a beautiful saw till the week before. Each plate of the dozen hand saws nestled in curves, cut perfectly square in the quarter sawn and quarter sawn and ammonia fumed white oak, finished in garnet shellac. Old Billy stopped swearing in mid sentence and arched an eyebrow at the saw till and a dozen gleaming apple handled hand saws. Henry plucked one out of the till, flexed the plate, and thumbed it hard in the center. Spring steel sang in the air. Mr. Weaver, saw, Henry said, handing over the saw. May I suggest you snap one of mine over that countertop if you can? Not a half hour later, old Billy wound up buying the entire lot that day from young Henry Diston. And in the days and the weeks that followed, so did every other hardware store throughout Philadelphia. Because quality sells. Now, that is how Henry Diston got his start. There's obviously far more to the story, which I'm here to tell you today. A tale of absolute steely resolve, grit, determination, and powering through intense tragedy and making something, achieving the American dream, coming to this country with nothing but an education and the character a young man inherited from his parents. Henry Diston was the middle child of seven siblings, five boys and two girls. Thomas Diston, his father, was an educated man, a self-accomplished, a technical man. He uh, possessed, he did not possess a degree, but he was a lay engineer. And it was at the, the onset of the Industrial Revolution when Thomas Diston had made a lace machine that he was selling to a company in Albany, New York. In fact, he even had plans on immigrating his entire family to New York, decided upon the outset to just take the lace machine over on a transatlantic voyage, along with one of his daughters, Mariana, who was 15 at the time, and young Henry, one of his middle sons, who was uh, 14. And you have to wonder, why did, he, why did he pick out Henry? And if anybody who comes from a large family can probably tell you there are family politics within a large group, and there are some kids, frankly, a little more confident than others. And I believe that's why Thomas selected Henry to come with him on that trip, which, which to put it in perspective today would be like maybe 30 years from now taking a trip to the moon uh, on uh, about a $5,000 ticket, not exactly chump change, but doable round trip. And once you're there, you're going to plan on staying for a while before you come back. Well, when you sail across the Atlantic on wind power for an eight-week voyage, that's a heck of a commitment. And then watch your father die on the gunnels of a ship before you can even debark to stroke out and die. And now it's just you and your sister. And that was the lot Henry Diston found himself in. So he did have to get a job. 
and he learned his saw manufacturing trade right there in Philadelphia with the struggling saw shop that ultimately went bankrupt because they just couldn't compete against the British saws. And then you got to consider perhaps there was a bit of prejudice involved against the British where in America, where it was kind of a rough and ready crowd there in, in Philadelphia and to where you're just hobnobbing on the street like everyone else trying to make it. And that was the world he found himself in, but he applied himself and he learned his trade well. And um, by the time he sold his first set of saws, he was on the move. He had made it. He was on his way. And um, if you can remember what it was like when you were in your early 20s, your very early 20s, what it was like to scrap and to share uh, an apartment with somebody and you can barely afford your car payment. It was probably a piece of crap to begin with. Uh, Henry Dyson was no different. All right. He had to make his saws in the backyard, sell them. And evidently the hardware stores liked what they saw because they began buying them, buying those saws. And with his first blush of success, Henry Diston fell in love. He was a church going young man. He went to, he was a Presbyterian, married his sweetheart. Twins are on the way, hired an employer or two, got his own saw shop going outside of his backyard. Life is good. It's moving along. He's living the American dream. He's 22. And then came the day when his first wife took a tumble down the stairs and died hemorrhaging, taking the twins with her. Oh, and then a shot burned down, all within the space of 24 hours. You're 22. You just had your first flush of success, and then your entire family dies. Can you imagine? A friend of his who believed in him who had means, gave Henry $5 and said, I, I know you can come back. Just do it, Henry. Come back to church. You'll, you'll get through this. You can pay me back later. That's exactly what Henry Diston did. And he set up a new saw shot, got his employees going again, started making saws, resuscitated his supply chain to an ever-expanding hardware market, and rebuilt his life. Got married a second time. She's expecting. And nine months later, a healthy baby boy, Henry's oldest son, Hamilton Diston, was born. And then a second shot burned down. But you know what? His wife is alive. His son is alive. It could be so much worse. This time, he rented space into a new steam-powered shop in which the Industrial Revolution, you know, working out the kinks with technology, got steam power going cutting those teeth, grinding the plates, carving the handles. Huge explosion one day. Took out his third shop. Began thinking, man, this, this saw business is kind of dangerous. I'm, maybe I ought to start keeping pails of water nearby, sawdust and so on. Develop his own OSHA uh, safety plan. Built up a fourth shop. That too burned down. Built up a fifth shop. This one didn't burn down. By now, we're at the end of 1840s. We're 1840, 1850. And by now, Henry must have put in some pretty good safety measures because the shot, the fifth one, did not burn down. He's still making saws. They look an awful lot like this. Here's one from that era, late 1840s. I managed to come in, too. Some knucklehead scrubbed all the patina off the plate, but whatever. The split nuts are still sound. Deep dish medallion. We have a member in the audience today, Mike Stemple, who can uh, share with you some pretty good history during the question and answer session as it comes available. Mike has an incredible collection. But getting back to Henry Diston, the fifth time was the charm. He got a saw manufactory going. He's got employees. He's cranking out the saws for a thirsty market requiring quality saws to, to make the westward expansion as people as the pioneers moved west and cut down the forest, built their homes, their communities, laid down railroad tracks, he was living the American dream. And his boy, Hamilton Diston, grew into his teenage years, began working at the, at the Diston saw manufactory, pushing a broom, cutting the teeth, stacking the lumber, stacking the metal, learning how to shape the metal, how to file the teeth, how to sharpen them, how to put a whole saw together, he worked side by side with the employees and learned the trade from the ground up. And Henry was 
so proud of this stuff. Just like my boy Joseph today is here. See him walking in the background there. He's in the shipping area today. And it's the same thing, watching your son flourish in a business that you build with your spouse. It's an incredible thing. But by the late 1850s, as Hamilton approached the Dolphin, here in America's Civil War, war clouds on the horizon. The men on the floor were talking about joining the fight. One day, Hamilton approached his father. Dad, I'm joining up. It's our country. We've got to end slavery. I'm, I'm joining up. Son, no, you're not. No, you're not. No way. Nope, 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 nope. You're going to stay here. I will buy you a replacement. That's what you did. If you had the means, you bought a, you bought someone else to substitute for you. you it was known as uh, getting your substitute instead of fighting. Hamilton was having nothing of it. Dad, I'm going. And then came that rueful day as Henry watched his oldest son, the one who lived, march off the war. And in 1861, watching your oldest son march off to war, you could only look at your other sons. He had five, hoping, hoping beyond hope that Hamilton would come back, but knowing that he probably wouldn't. Because in those days, when you took a 59 caliber shot to a limb, that limb was coming off. If you took it anywhere on the chest, you were done. Henry said goodbye to his son. And then four years later, Hamilton came marching back home with the other 60 men or the survivors of the 60 men who volunteered from distant saw works. They raised their own company, country, company of infantry. They offered Hamilton a commission, but he says, no, no, I'm no better than the rest of these men. I'll just serve as a private alongside the people that I've grown up working with. And you can probably imagine the intense respect that the Civil War veterans from distant saw works had for young Hamilton. And Henry got to see his boy come home. And that's when Distin Saw Words, Keystone Saw Words became Distin and Son, singular sense. As the years progressed toward through the Reconstruction era into the 1870s, Henry groomed Hamilton to become what we would refer to today as the CEO. So he was heavily involved in operations. And as, his young, as Hamilton's younger brothers came of age, Jacob, uh, the others, uh, the, their names escape me at the moment. Um, Henry would assign them into the key staff positions of any large organization, personnel, operations, logistics. With always an eye toward Hamilton, making sure that he was groomed to take the company over. Because Henry, too, as he edged toward his late 50s, felt his own mortality on the way. Coming. It began as a series of small strokes by 1878. By then, in, in the, 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 the mid to late 1870s, Henry envisioned an acreage of 41. He purchased with Hamilton and his key supervisors in distance saw works, a 40 acre plot of land on the outskirts of Philadelphia, known today as the Taconi District, where he envisioned a place to live and work, where his employees, of all backgrounds, could have a decent place to live and work back in the age of the robber baron, where employees were no better than the slaves down south, fed pennies, starvation wages, living in squalor. Henry opted to build housing. He was one of the wealthiest men in America by then. And he put that money into quality housing, parks, um, houses of worship, representative of his employee base. He kept out the tanneries and the saloons and the brothels, and he built, he, he turned the earth over in a symbolic citywide recognition of what he was doing, a place to live and work. Uh, the, you hear me use that phrase, there's actually a book called A Place to Live and Work, uh, written by a scholar by the name of, of uh, Harry Silcox that describes this in great detail. It's, great, it's a great book of American entrepreneurialism and responsible paternalistic leadership over those who are, whose destiny you control, you know, your workers. Henry was incredibly loyal to his workers. He never had any strike issues or, or problems like that. 
he gave them a place to live and work, a decent place, a clean place, and a place where you could work, raise your family and earn a fair wage and buy your own home. And that was Henry Dyson's legacy. He not only he not only created some of the world's finest saws, like this 18, late 1870s vintage V8. All right, you can see here. Gorgeous, highly contoured apple handle. Deep dish medallion, skew back design. He chalked it out one day on, on the shop of his office floor, on the wooden floor, and told his foreman, you know, let's just make a saw that's straight back number seven. Let's cut a little metal here, lighten the weight, and make a portable saw. And you still see hundreds of these proliferate on eBay today. It's why we at Bad Axe endeavored when we came out with our hand saws to do the same thing. He's one of our 22 winters. All right, we did it, Henry Dixon's auto. But as the, the 1870s began to conclude, Henry's health began failing and he too died of a stroke in 1878 at the age of 59. And that's when Hamilton Diskin took over the company. And over the years, as succeeding generations of Diskins provided armaments to American wars, steel plates, um, they were always behind any American war effort um, because they felt it was their patriotic duty. They made the world's finest saws that are still abound well over a century later that you can still pick up off a of flea market or eBay and tune back up. And Lord knows we've tuned up more than our share of distance saws from a long time ago here at the Bad Axe Workshop. Uh, those saws still do exactly, exactly what they were intended to back in the day. Sever wood fiber quite well. So to conclude the Henry Disson story, I would like to leave you with the uh, notion that here at the Bad Axe Workshop, which we just moved into a new workshop here, uh, we're quite happy with it. We still have some work. Uh, I don't dare show you the rest of the workshop because it's a complete disarray over on uh, the, other, the other side. We hope to have that fixed here within the month. But um, we, uh, we have a banner hung over one of our walls. And that banner reads, what would Henry do? So with any question on how to proceed, how to do something right, and if we're in a quandary, says, geez, we did it this way or should we do it that way? We look at that banner and ask ourselves, well, what would Henry do? And so I will conclude this tale of American immigration and entrepreneurial success with uh, proper homage to Henry Diston and uh, open the floor for any questions you may have. Brilliant. Uh, Mark, uh, absolutely fantastic. As good as the first time I've heard it, but I think you've had a, almost a year to, um, to practice that even more. That's a fantastic story. Really, really good. Really, really Thank good. You. Um, so uh, we're going to go out to questions. And the best way to do it is if you, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you've got this thing called chat. Um, and if you put your name in the chat, um, then you can, you can uh, ask the question and I'll, I'll, I'll call them up. Um, oh, <laughs> this is quite interesting. Normally, Chester beats us every single time. But Chester, today you, you didn't. Jim. Jim, if you'd like to unmute and, and go with the first question. Yeah, I was, I, I was actually, I did get insider information about how to do that, actually. <laughs> Mark, that was absolutely fantastic. I was speechless, actually spellbound. So thank you so much. It was tremendous. Um, well, it is indeed an honor to meet you, Jim. I follow your Facebook posts every time I see them. And it's a pleasure to converse with you today. Oh, thank you. Um, my question uh, arises actually from Facebook. It arises from the Unplugged Woodworker Group and uh, a gentleman named Kyle there who, who kindly donated to the little museum I have in Kent here, Tropical Kent, by the way. It's 82, which is 33 degrees today. Um, but he sent me, I'm reaching out for it. He sent me a a D23 lightweight plate, which I believe you're probably familiar with. It's one of the new old stock ones that surfaced a while back. And he said to me, 
Jim, I want you to put a handle on it. Um, and I've been trying to get a handle on it ever since, if you excuse the pun. Um, my biggest problem is that, which clearly comes from a manufacturing process that belongs to a machine. Um, and presumably, the circular back to it uh, sits into a handle that has been cut by a circular saw and then stopped um, so that it, it butts up like that within the saw handle. Now, my twofold, my questions are, how the hell do I do that without power tools? Which is probably not gonna happen. Um, however, I do have a devil with tail that, that um, is capable of doing that. But um, the thought of putting a block of wood upright like that and pushing it into a rotating saw blade and then stopping, and then hoping that the thing doesn't kick back and shove me in the face is something that holds me with trepidation. So I wondered as a saw maker of the distant ilk that whether or not you had any tips about how to make a handle that that fit to. I'm afraid not. I didn't think you would. <laughs> well, I don't want to, I don't want to tap dance. Can I see the silhouette of that plate again? Uh, now, let me run, run through the course of the spine through the camera. Let me look at the spine. Yeah, keep going all the way down to the toe. Yeah, that, that's not skew back, is it? No, that it's a straight, straight back. Shot, yeah, it's a straight back light, lightweight. Say that, yeah, and, and it, does say, uh, it does say 23, D23 on the edge. There you go. You know, it's a fine saw. I, I've, I've always liked working on those saws. The, the metal always seems to be great. I want to say they came out in the 1880s. Um, but um, that cover top, that cover top plate, you know, that bugs me too. The, the one difference when we decided to bring back the distant D8, the only design change we made was that cover top. I don't know who here in the audience has seen a, a bad axe saw, but we opted to go for the let in handle. It's just far less of a pain in the ass to manufacture. And every cover top D8 or any other saw such as your D23 that I've ever encountered, usually it was very prone to splintering right where the plate meets the handle. And I thought, you know, not only, I just don't like it. I'm sure it served its purpose well, but I don't like it. And uh, so we adopt the handling pattern of Simon's, which is a cut as such, here, let me just go grab one, I'll show you. There we go. All right, so we opted for this method of handling. It's just cleaner, more elegant, just as secure, and uh, that's the only exception we made in the D8 design. We opted not to do that, that um, cover top method with the radius heel end at the spine of the plate. You know, for the reasons you mentioned, Jim, it's just too much. I think it's too much of a pain in the ass to do it. Can it be done? Of course, but it would drive up cost, I think, uh, needlessly. Yeah, I think, I think what I might do, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I've got two options. I can get a hacksaw. Or, and that seems sacrilege to me because these are new old stock plates and it's absolutely pristine condition. Right. It's never been, never ever been used. And that, that would, I, I've got three options. One is to hang it on the wall uh, as an example of how it looks internally. The second is to get a hacksaw to it and do what you've just suggested. And the I third option is, no. no. You know what, there's going to be a talented woodworker out there that can make that handle for you, or at least help you solve that riddle of getting that radial cut inside the wood. You might call around uh, some CNC wood shops in, in your area. Just, you know, you can fashion the handle easily enough. It's that cut you're after, that radial cut. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I fully intend to, well, I'm trying to make it out of apple because I've got some local apple, which is really matured. And I've got some pretty nice, really hard burr apple uh, as well, uh, which 
you know, is, is going to be what I would choose out of respect for what Distan did. Mm -hmm. um, I could have used Boxwood. Uh, I wanted to use, <laughs> I want to use Boxwood. I, yeah, of course, I want to use Boxwood. But um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, my, my third option, which is getting a jig up uh, to actually make it less lethal to sh shove it over the top of a rotating blade, uh, actually might be the one I'm, I'm going to choose to do because I, I, I want to do it in house. I, I don't, I, I'm a bit kind of, uh, it's kind of a pride thing. So I don't really want to farm it out, even though I could. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I'll go with that option. But thank you very much. I won't hold up everybody's questions. Thank you very much for taking the time to prove to me that one it's thing not I would, uh, Hey, you know what, Jim? One thing I would add to that, though, is do some research, one, to identify the radius itself on your plate, and then try to find a soft blade manufacturer who makes radial saw blades that can get it thin enough to achieve the kind of curve you need for that handle. It's obviously going to be a thin curve. Uh, I saw somebody post up on the bulletin board moments ago about Sergey, I believe it was, uh, mentioning uh, uh, a sled on your table saw and uh, doing a, a cut with a sled. You know, I'll leave that. You know, I'll be honest with you. I'm a better saw maker than I am a woodworker. And it's one of my intentions one of these days to uh, get back into woodworking. Brilliant. brilliant. Excellent. Thank Great. you for that. So, Jim, you're going to have to get a handle on it uh, soon. Okay, uh, Chester, Very next on, on, the, on the list. So, um, Chester, if you unmute yourself, just while Chester's unmuting himself, if I could just ask the rest of you to stay muted, because um, when you come off of mute, uh, sorry, if you, when you come off of unmuted, um, it then puts you up on the big screen. So, uh, if, if uh, Mark uh, stays unmuted, um, so that we can hear Mark, and then uh, Chester, where, where's Chester at the moment? Am I unmuted? Yep, you're unmuted. Okay. Um, hey, that was a great, uh, a great uh, uh, both pieces. The, the 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 reading of your of your fictional characterization as well as the information afterwards, and um, I, I, it was really uh, wonderful to hear all of that. Um, I was following along. I don't know if uh, as a member of the MWTCA years ago they sent us all this little flyer and included it in the 1914 Henry Diston catalog reprint that Roger Smith did. And then on the back is a historical summary of Diston. Um, and I was following along and I was uh, very amazed at your, uh, at your knowledge because you were right on uh, the spot with those dates. Um, I'd only have to add that you left out Horace and Jacob and William because you couldn't remember. And I have that same issue a lot. And uh, the, those are the other brothers of Distant that. Um, it's too many brain cells disappearing, disappearing with age, you know? Mine disappeared with my hair as well. So um, <laughs> could be age as well. Um, a couple of things here. Um, one on Jim's saw. I don't know if you uh, I don't know if you uh, are familiar, Mark, with um, Baldwin, Tuttle, and Bolton. Have you ever heard of them? Uh, no, I have not. Well, they were around for about fifty years um, in um, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is one of their catalogs. This is the 1920 catalog. This is their 1912 catalog. And what they were were saw and knife fitting company, and they made the tools. To, they made the tools to make the saw blades. And the, uh, this is the earlier, this is the 1912 catalog. And in it, they talk about how they'd already been in business for 40 some odd, some odd years. So they, they made swages and, um, and tools for fitting knives and for saws. And they eventually uh, bought out, um, ah, well, there's my memory. Um, the guy there that made uh, made the uh, oh my gosh Oliver, they eventually bought out Oliver Manufacturing and Toolworks, uh, and uh, uh, and so uh, so they took that over because he was going bankrupt. He was spending too much money. But the history of all of these industrialists are fascinating. Um, so uh, so I told you the names of the sons, and then um, uh, there's another thing that's mentioned in this that I don't, you didn't really touch on too much was that when he started selling his saws, 
because everybody had such an affinity for British steel and, and refused to buy American steel, that for the, uh, because of their quality differences, for the first uh, year or so, he advertised that he was actually using British steel from Sheffield, but unmarked because he couldn't sell his American steel until people started getting used to his saws. And, and, um, and because of that, um, then he, it flew off the shelf. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that, and the other thing about Jim's thing is uh, I was wondering if you couldn't take the handle and cut it like an open top handle so you can cut straight through and then infill that top area where you would have the round with boxwood. So you could do the handle in apple, but you could do a spline like boxing on a plane in boxwood to fill that space and it'd give a nice little feature. That's it, thank you, great presentation. Loved it. Thank you. Well, there we go. Ad advice from uh, Chester there. So uh, next one is uh, Thiago. Thiago, I think, uh, from Brazil, I think. Is that right, Thiago? Hello. Greetings, greetings from Brazil. Yeah. Hey. This, this is uh, a well, completely worldwide um, uh, uh, 101 today. You know, every, everywhere we're, we're doing well. So good luck. <laughs> Yes, well, and th thanks again for doing this. Uh, and thank you, Mark, for the presentation. It, it was uh, really interesting. Uh, I am uh, I'm a bit curious about the uh, your training and the uh, state of the craft of, of saw making when you uh, got into it. Um, I, I, I believe Skelton said something about saw making being a lost uh, art or a lost uh, trade in a way. And um, and it, here in Brazil, just as a side note, we have been using Japanese saws uh, extensively in the uh, past few years because uh, it, it's hard to find well, good tools, but also hard to find someone who can sharpen a saw. And uh, and I know well, you, you obviously learned a, a, a bunch from Distin, uh, studying uh, him, his life and his uh, tools. So I was uh, curious about your training. How, how did you learn to make saws when you decide to, to, to do it? And, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, what, uh, how did you find the, the, the world of saw making or, or uh, uh, saw making in the US? How, how, uh, how, how did you find that trade? Thanks. Okay, yeah, I get asked that occasionally. Uh, I have a pretty good streak of OCD going. Uh, that's probably the main thing. Uh, okay. Honestly, and I'm not being snide, uh, Henry Diston and his sons uh, taught me. I read the Diston catalog over and over and learned that the first thing to do was to clean the, the saw if it's dirty. Uh, rust scale will certainly invite cut friction. So operating on a clean plate to begin with, you shape the teeth and then you set the teeth and then you sharpen them to joint, all right? And it's really as simple as that, although it's a bit like playing the guitar. If you're obsessed with learning how to play the guitar, you're gonna learn how to play the guitar. And I can tell you, and I would bet next month's wages, profit, everything, on the fact that every single one of you in attendance here today is committed to the notion of excellence. All right, or else you wouldn't be in the woodworking to begin with. So you take it upon yourself to learn a skill. If you have enough OCD, you'll learn it. And every one of you, whether you're a, phys a physician or an engineer or, or an NSA analyst, you take your job seriously and you do quite well with it. And that probably, that ethic and that ethos applies directly to how you work wood in your own individual way. So, to answer your question more directly about how I learned how to do this, I simply, and this was, uh, I began getting interested in it, oh, what about 13, 14 years ago? Um, I had spent a full career in the Army. I was 28 years in the Army, uh, quite a long time. I was in my 40s. And by the time I hit my mid 40s, I was pretty well immersed, like virtually everybody here, in the notion of vintage hand tools. So I went through a North Brothers drill phase. I went through a Stanley bedrock plane phase. I read Chris Schwartz's article on how to craft the robo bench. I thought I gotta do that. Um, went through these various woodworking tool phases. 
and found myself, you know, I'm actually kind of a better tool restorer than I am a woodworker. And it just caught my fancy. And then came the day when I retired out of the Army, had just redeployed from Afghanistan, called a 28-year career done and over with. And the last thing I wanted to do was go to work for the man. Um, so I knew I had to do something of an entrepreneurial bent. And so I looked at my wood shop. And by then, I had been learning how to sharpen saws, you know, with mixed results. I knuckled down, really got into a rhythm with it, realized that the whole secret, if you will, to saw sharpening is just persistence. It really is like learning how to play the guitar and achieving a consistent symmetry with the teeth. That I learned things along the way that like bevel isn't really that important. Um, your rake angle is pretty darn important because that governs the speed of your cut. Bevel is not so important, particularly for back saws, because with thin metal, uh, that thin metal, what you're trying to do is shove metal through wood fiber. Thin metal is going to, going to plow through wood fiber. Thick metal, like you'll find on these, these ancient miter saws and hand saws where the metal gauge is uh, 04, 035 thick, that's where bevel plays more of a role. So you just pick up things like that through sheer repetition and practice and Along the way, you go, well, what if I do it this way? What if I do it that way? And you just start unlocking those secrets. And it really does come back to the simple notion of you get the teeth to all look alike and sharpened at the same height, sharpening to joint. And as long as you're sharpening to joint, pickups in your symmetry can, are easily forgiven because you're still going to sever wood fiber quite well. So that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question. Bottom line is, Sharpen to joint based on the rock solid foundation of a highly consistent set. Brilliant. And just dogged persistence. That's where the OCD comes in. There it is. Good, good. I'll say one more thing. There was this one magical summer where I, I could identify which saw I worked on last year. Oh, yeah, I got nine PPI going on right there, you know, where I scratched the hell out of my arm. Oh, this one, that, yeah, that, was a, that took me all day. That was a 14 PPI carcass saw right there, you know? So. You just, it's like anything else. There's nothing precious about it. You just do it. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, next question is from Shrenik. Hi there, Mark. Thank you very much for um, a brilliant talk. I, I didn't know anything about distance saws apart from that I enjoy using them um, until today, obviously. And my, my question is really about saw sharpening, and it's, it's, it's great that you've just gotten onto that topic, and it's actually to do with the, the method that you use to sharpen. So um, obviously a saw file and a saw set and a, and a joint to, uh, and a file to join the joint teeth, but do you use a, a, a guide to hold your saw files? Do you just hold it freehand? How do you tend to go about it? Very good. Excuse me one second. I'm gonna go grab a saw set so I can illustrate. That is a good looking workshop he's got there. R rather nice. Okay. So the process is you shape the teeth. I'm sure we've all picked up saws in which those teeth look like cows and calves and plateaus and steep daggers and asymmetrical. You want to get your teeth all in a consistent symmetry. All right. Now, many of us get really worked up over degrees. Degrees aren't so important. You want a steeper rake angle for aggressive rip cuts with the grain. You want not so steep for cross cut going across the grain. All right. A good analogy is you want to shape your teeth like knives to slice across the grain. That's where your bevel comes in. You want to shape your teeth like chisels to chop the little, like coffee stir sticks, you know, tightly bundled hardwood. It's like a bunch of dried out coffee stir sticks, very tightly bound together, okay? Softwood is more like soda straws with some moisture left inside, also bound together. And the wood you, you work really dictates how you want to set up your saw. So most of us are furniture makers here or strive to be. One of these days, I hope to make some furniture. I'll, I'll probably come across the pond and take a class there from Mr. Ian Parker himself, no less, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, become a better woodworker in my own right. 
but I do sever wood fiber every day. And uh, we test cut all of our saws on uh, fully cured, dense white oak, because why would we want to test cut our saws in pine? Anybody can plow through pine, all right? So um, to answer your question about the processes, the very first thing you do is you shape your teeth and get them consistent. You with me? One side of your tooth is going to be steep. That's the cutting side. The back side of the tooth is going to be not so steep. All right. If you were to draw uh, an arc between the lines, you're going to come up with 60 degrees. All right. So you're making little 60 degree triangles in which one side is almost like a right triangle for rip cuts and uh, backed off a, a right triangle for cross cuts. I prefer to use the clock method of reference rather than get hung up on degrees. It's like the rules of the English language. You have to know the grammar before you start breaking the rules on purpose to express your personal written style. You follow? Yep. Okay. All right. So if you back off just off vertical a little bit, if you were to envision a clock, instead of a, you know, back it off to maybe, you know, if straight up and down was 12 o'clock at 90 degrees, back it off to, oh, maybe about 1230. And that's a good rate angle for rip cuts. Back it off more to say one o'clock, 1.30, that's all you really need to make uh, cross cuts with. So it doesn't take a whole lot of variance there. I do it by eye, and when I sharpen uh, my first pass, I'm, I'm practically eyeball level with the tooth line where I can see it in my vise. And I have it high enough to where I can hang my head and crouch over and see that practically, because I'm mostly concerned with the shape of the teeth. So I'll do that shaping first, first pass, flip around the saw, do the, do the other thing. And then on the second pass, that's where I refine the bevel and very little bevel at that, all right? Um, bevel is highly overrated. Uh, cross cut, dedicated cross cut, typically 20 degrees of break, 20 degrees of bevel. You're gonna spend all day just going, geez, when's this gonna be over, you know? And, and uh, that kind of relaxation and rake and, and cross cut bevel comes at the expense of accuracy and edge retention. So we make our saw teeth more like chisels. If we want to have a saw for cross cut, we throw in, ooh, we relax the rake just a little bit, throw in a little more bevel, and uh, as long as we're uniform, it's gonna cut like there's no tomorrow. So the first step, shape the teeth. Second step, you set the teeth. And this is also something we take quite seriously. Now here at Bad Axe, we have our own proprietary equipment and tooling. But what I'm showing you right here is a Henry Diston Star hammer set. Everybody see it okay? It's got a plunger, it has a hammer, it has a beveled anvil. And when you smack the tooth, what you're doing is you're actually coining metal to use metal forming parlance. You're coining it. You are rearranging molecules. Now we've all seen the plier set, right? That you squeeze with your hand. Well, are there any physicians here in the audience? Any physicians at all? Anybody that knows their anatomy and physiology? Who can tell me how many points of your anatomy are involved in this action. I've had saw sharpening seminars in which I've had physicians tell me, I once had a seminar with three physicians in it. Two were surgeons, one guy was a pain medication guy. And they all had a consensus. That's about 45 plus uh, bones, muscles, uh, ligaments, everything. That's a lot of variables to squeeze a tooth into proper set. All right, so that's a lot of variables. You have to ask yourself, what is it we're attempting to shape? It's spring steel, right? What does spring steel want to do when you push it one way? What does it want to do? Push back. It wants to push back, right? It wants to spring back. So are you going to beg and plead with spring steel to conform to your desired set? Or are you going to smack it like a drill sergeant, putting troops into formation, getting them uniform, rearranging everything down at the molecular level, all right? So that's where saw sets come in. For years, we used uh, these little saw sets for dovetail saws and carcass saws. That's a Seymour Smith. Same principle, you're smacking a punch down onto a beveled anvil to get that tiny patch of real estate to conform with the brake line just above the gullet of a tooth. And anyway, the point I'm making is when you set your teeth, you have to Pay attention to what you're doing. Set strength. If you were to break out digital calipers and measure how your teeth splay outwards, and if you were to mic that, um, there's a variance there. The thicker the metal, the more the set. 
the thinner the metal, the less the set. Now, if you were to set an 018 plate upwards of 035 combined step, set, that's way too much. So over the years, we figured out how much set to apply based on the gauge of metal we're working with, all right? So that's step number two, setting your teeth. And then finally, sharpening, that's almost the easiest part, you know? You sharpen the joint with the consistent symmetry. So, clean the plate, shape the teeth, set the teeth, sharpen the teeth. That's the sequence. Brilliant. So, a lesson within the talk. I hope that's answered your question, Trenick. Um, so, next, yeah, next no, up on... I, I just... Sorry, go on, Trenick. No, I, I just wanted to know about sharpening, and uh, that pretty much answered my question. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, next a lot up, of people put it up on a pedestal, and they're almost afraid to do it. So, just do it. Like, I, 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 like the Nike always, commercial, just do it. I always go... Just remember I, to sharpen. Your goal is to sharpen them to joint. Yep, I do sharpen my saws myself. I'm just looking for more tips and advice. This high-speed tool right here, all right? Oh, this one's special. It has a distant handle on it. All right. It's a mill file. It's a simple mill file. You don't need a fancy tool to joint flats on top of your tooth line. Just use a mill file, okay? Establish your flats. Sharpen until the flats go away and no more. Brilliant. Don't take that one extra stroke because now you'll have a short tooth. What you don't want is big tooth, little tooth, big tooth, little tooth because only the big teeth are doing the cutting. And if you think about it, it's only the upper quarter of a tooth that's actually severing wood fiber, right? It's certainly not the entire tooth. So if you sharpen the joint, you get all those little buggers doing their duty, as opposed to only half of them, and the other half are sitting back in the bushes, you know, simping mint juleps and uh, slacking off, right? You want all those troopers in the firing line pulling the trigger at the same time. Good, good. Uh, Jeffrey, can yeah, I just uh, uh, hands up, just for a second? Isn't this normally where you, uh, you you could actually jump in now and uh, ask Mark if he'd come back sometime in the future and do a little tutorial on uh, saw sharpening? I'm what? sorry, Derek, what? This I, is usually where I'd, I'd expect Jeffrey to, uh, to jump in and ask you to come back sometime in the future and do us a little seminar on saw sharpening. Ready, willing, and able. Fantastic. Right. Yay! Pandemic permitting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ne next time. Only if I'm um, allowed to drink a proper amount of British beer while I'm there. Oh, no, we're talking about on here. So you can, you can drink as much beer in your, in your workshop as you want, can't you? Of it's 2 30 in the <laughs> afternoon for you so it's, it's it's maybe too early to drink beer um nick nick Gibbs not too early. is going to ask up the next question so nick um well mark i mean good to see you thanks for the saw a long long time ago you sharpened and renovated for me and then left i left it for such a long time i forgot who'd done it and uh, fortunately i came across you uh, actually i'm only asking a question because i want to find out how you do ask a question uh having um, never been on this before but i think i've been now mark a long time ago i went on a course with a japanese sharp sharp uh, craftsman sh um, master craftsman at sharpening for japanese swords it's quite rare and it was with the timber framers association and uh, he said that um the push stroke is actually the most effective it's much the most effective way of cutting wood and in an ideal world he said that uh, it was for an, um, a translator so it was quite difficult to understand that um, the ideal world is to have a japanese configuration tooth but on the push stroke and um or if i heard him right whereas the japanese um, plates are so thin that they can only be done on the pull stroke so to speak. does that make any sense to you yeah um, Japanese pull saws are wonderful saws and um, I love the Japanese timber framing tradition but if you think about it their entire woodworking gestalt came about on working with softwoods that proliferate Japan they don't have hardwoods over there so the technology that developed from that was entirely designed to cut softwoods can you cut hardwoods Yes, but occasionally you're going to snap a tooth off, okay? Mm -hmm. Will they track the line beautifully? Absolutely. But out, excuse me, out of the Western woodworking tradition, we work with hardwoods, mm -hmm. where the thicker plate and more robust nature of a 60-degree tooth, which is resharpenable, and I won't say necessarily easily resharpenable, but certainly more resharpenable than a Japanese 
sawtooth tooth configuration. All right, um, it's far more robust with the thicker metal and pushing the uh, pushing the, um, the the tooth line through beech, uh, cherry, walnut, uh, white oak, etc. All those dense coffee stir sticks. Okay, you need a robust tooth to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, Nick, I'll have you know that we here at Bad Axe, bearing in line what I mentioned here earlier to Shrenek, all right, about sharpening the joint and calibrating a properly hammer set tooth line to a precise configuration, most appropriate for that gauge of metal involved. It is these little secrets that we filed away in our own little box that has enabled us to wean so many people off their Japanese pulse saws, all right? And um, with a properly tuned Western fish shraya saw that's been sharpened the joint based on a digitally calibrated set, you'll be amazed at the outcome. Well, I'm blessed because of that day to have a Veritas tenancel which was sharp, was completely, the, the teeth were filed off. And then he, um, he filed shapes with the Japanese configurer. On a very tough saw. Uh, which he did himself. And then I had to try and do the same thing uh, on a little silky saw. And um, it was... <laughs> It was quite an experience. What was most interesting was the, the the many many files that they use, hundreds of files. They they yeah. they're, they're about I guess about three or four inches long, and um, they're like a diamond configuration. I'm sure you've seen them, haven't you, Mark? I guess. Oh yeah. Um, and um, I'm not sure how how many other people have seen them, and um, they just break and they go through one or two for every saw they sharpen. It's extraordinary. They come in packs. Hundreds wow. Of that's uh, brilliant, Nick. Brilliant, Nick. I mean, listening to uh, Mark talk about the saw sharpening, I mean, last year we did do a course at the London Design and Engineering UTC where Mark came down and gave a five day fully intensive course on, on saw sharpening. We, we, we were meant to do it again in, in uh, uh, November of this year, but we're, we're not sure yet because of COVID and stuff. So we will keep you posted. I mean, it was quite amazing, really, because um, the course went live and, and within 24 hours, it was sold out. It was it was crazy. So there's certainly a, a massive demand for, for saw sharpening there. Um, Nick, you've, you've just uh, muted yourself. I'm going to unmute you again. Um, uh, this is the yeah. first time you've, be, you've been on here. Um, so you kind yeah. of don't really know how I do things. But um, I'm really <laughs> quite a big bully, actually. Um, and... Um, I'm I'm sort of looking at you because you've started another magazine. You've I have, got your yeah. your first magazine, which was the British Woodworker, which was absolutely amazing, um, yeah. and, and now you've come back with this new magazine uh, called Quercus, and 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 I'm, I'm literally I'm I'm absolutely riveted to it. So many great articles in 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 the <laughs> first uh, first edition. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank um, you. So. I'd, I'd like to bully you, Nick, um, yeah. and I'd like to say, Nick, would you like to come on next week and talk to us about being an editor in a woodworking magazine? Maybe look at your um, most recent, uh, you know, publication. How how do you get people to talk, and and um, maybe some things that you know you're really passionate about, and and come on and sort of tell us all about it. I would, I would love to. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I can. <laughs> I feel humbled, though, by the amount of knowledge there is about hand tools around here, because I've started this magazine not necessarily because I'm a passionate hand tool um, enthusiast, uh, just because I wanted to launch another magazine and it seemed like a, a, a cool one to do. <laughs> don't don't, don't, don't belittle it. You're doing well. It's well, a great magazine. And it has to be admitted that, um, to be all sort of emotional and sentimental, that the chairmaker John Brown and I actually devised the idea about 20 years ago. And um, I can't remember uh, which of us actually came up with the idea of a chairmaking magazine. I'm going to say it was me because he's, he's no longer with us. Um, and we were called it Quirkus. And this is probably, tw it's more than 20 years ago because my eldest daughter was doing that. So, Nick, and I'm going to stop you. Nick, Nick, I'm going to stop you because. Um, this is not your night. This is Mark uh, Mark Harrell's <laughs> night for Maddox. And next week, you can tell us all about this, about okay. how you came up with the name and how you did everything. Okay. So Nick Gibbs next week on Bench Talk 101. Thank you very much, Nick. You very I'll, much. I'll, I'll <laughs> um, this is the typical thing that we do on here. We bully people and, and, and then we get this 
wealth of uh, expertise right the way across. So our next um, person who wants to ask a question is Josh. Um, so Josh, if you're still with us and you want to unmute yourself. Yes. There he or, is. Okay. Yeah, uh, at some point, Distin spun off uh, Jackson handsaw line. I was wondering what you know about the relationship between those saws and the main line uh, Distin saws. Did that come through? Not the last part. Say it again, please. Oh, uh, I was wondering what you know about the relationship between the Jackson saws and the main line Distin saws. You know, uh, in entry, I'm going to give my response and then... Uh, Jeffrey, I would like to invite Mike Stemple to uh, contribute uh, some of his thoughts. Uh, for those of you in the audience who don't may not know or heard of him, Mike Stemple is one hell of a saw collector. Uh, certainly, uh, th this guy's got not just a panther saw in his arsenal. He has a family of panther saws, all right? And Mike is absolutely immersed in Saw history, American saw making history. So uh, to, to lead off though, before all, before Jeffrey, we can bring Mike in here. Let me just say that Distin was incredibly loyal and good to his employees. But if you were a competing saw maker, he would rub your ass out like Bill Gates in a heartbeat. He'd take you to court, he'd sue you into Rice Krispies and then take over your operation. All right, so all these names, I wanna say there's like 19 saw companies that uh, uh, Distin took over throughout the years. Uh, Jackson was certainly one. He took over uh, Vulcan Saw Works. Um, the, 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 it's almost easier to say out of all the competing saw makers, the ones he wasn't able to rub out were Simons and Atkins. All right, now I'd like to open the floor to answer that question more replete than I just did to Mike Stemple. Take it away, Mike. Oh, oh, you want me to talk? I want you to talk about, about some of the saw makers that Distin rubbed out. Well, I'll address this question about the Jackson uh, saws. Uh, most of the secondary lines Distin produced were, were very good saws. They produced them uh, to sell to hardware stores and uh, other companies. And uh, they were really, they were called secondary lines, but the quality was almost, or and probably the equal of their main lines. Uh, this is so a Jack. That's, that's Jackson and any of the other secondary lines. My, my Just, favorite handle. I'm sorry? Uh, it's, it's my favorite handle on a back saw. Okay. Uh, there was an early, Jackson maker in Monroe, New York, uh, years before uh, Dustin appropriated the name in 1860. Uh, and I, I missed uh, Mark's question there uh, as well. Uh, can you repeat your question, Mark? Yeah, just basically getting a sense for the various sock companies that Dustin took over, um, like Vulcan and Jackson and, and some of the others. Uh, any insight you can provide on that? Well, uh, he was uh, he was aggressive. He uh, either ran you out or bought you out. There were only a few companies that survived uh, uh, Dustin's uh, uh, reign. Uh, I wanted to address something about history real quick. Uh, that you neglected to do probably because of uh, the uh, the folks here uh, being English. Uh, the uh, when uh, England lost the War of 1812 or whatever, they got revenge by flooding America with goods, tools, especially below their cost and they ruined a lot of the uh, industry in the United States for years afterwards. Uh, the saw making industry didn't really recover until Dustin and others got thing going, things going in the 1840s. So it was a smart move on their part. 
since they couldn't do it on the battlefield, they, they did it uh, in the pocketbook. So uh, worked for them and uh, it took us a long time to, to get over it. And, uh, and uh, Dustin, in order to get around the tariffs on uh, non-Commonwealth countries, opened a plant in Canada, ha ha, and uh, then sent his nephew to England to sell his saws, uh, just to rub it in the faces of the English sawmakers. And, uh, and uh, you know, for many, many years, there was a prejudice against anything but Sheffield Steel. They, they were considered, uh, uh, after Sologen, they uh, were considered to have the best steel in the world, and American steel was considered inferior. And Diston opened a steel plant, uh, his own facility in the 1850s, but kept it quiet and uh, didn't advertise the fact that he was using his own American steel for a long time. And uh, so I'm just rambling on here. So I don't no, know how much. That's a good point. He put, you know, an interesting thing about Henry Diston is that he did the assembly line long before Henry Ford ever did. I'm sorry, I missed that. He poured steel ahead of Andrew Carnegie, and he did the assembly line long before Henry Ford. Yeah. Well, it, you know, uh, it's a very complicated. Most of our sawmakers here in the United States, the early sawmakers, were English. Uh, William McNeese was Irish, but other than that, most of them came from the Birmingham area, including Henry. And uh, the uh, just they're all in our work together. We're partners with each other. Walsh and Griffiths brought a lot of them over in the 1830s, and they had to work off uh, their indebtedness to him before they went out on their own, the, those guys before they went out on their own. So. I, I think this is almost a, another separate talk that you could you could go into and really you know give the history of, of other makers there. So maybe we could uh, come back to that uh, later, Mike, if, if if you don't mind. That'd be fine. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much longer I can sit here. <laughs> no, no, it's too long. No, no, not tonight. I mean, I mean later another day. Um, look, we got one more. We got, we got um, two more questions. We have got a hand up, and we've got um, uh, uh, and, a, and a question in front of the hand up. So, um, Rusty is the next. Qu Sorry, uh, Josh. I hope that answered your question, Josh. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank no, you. Lovely, lovely. Um, so Rusty, R Rusty joined it late. Um, just if you do join this late, um, we do record this meeting, and it goes on to YouTube. Um, as soon as I can. Uh, hopefully, it's within sort of 48 hours. Um, so, but by, by Sunday, you've got you've got this on YouTube, so you can watch it. So, Rusty, you missed the start of it, but uh, you can watch it on, on YouTube uh, to catch up with it. So, Rusty, over to you. Thank you, and I definitely will be watching it on YouTube. Even the ones I do watch live, I go back and watch on YouTube again. Just the wealth of information again. I, I thank you guys so much, um, Mark. I, I have. Uh, Two questions, and one is shorter than the other. So as you said, you, you try your saws on oak. I have a distant DA 28 inch rip saw that I've ripped eight quarter white oak, six feet of it, and it worked like a charm. And I wonder, how, how do I date the saw? How do I know how old it is? Is it, it's kind of hard to read on an etching, and, and I'm guessing that's not gonna take long. But the other question is, which already was asked, but I kind of feel you didn't really answer. Why saws? You could have been doing anything. You could be curing cancer. You could be doing the amount of skill and, and tenacity you're showing. Why not chisels? Why not violins? So what is it that, that saw, I feel like saws a very specific, um, just after the last two talks, it's a very specific instrument of woodworking that seems to be attracting very particular minds, but why saws? Okay, all right, the first question, go to distonianinstitute.com. We're distant, distonianinstitute.com. 
That's a website maintained by Eric von Snyder. It was the Saw Geek, all right? And he has probably forgotten more about Henry Diston than most people will ever, ever learn. He has a link on his website, How to Date Your Saw. I can tell you right now, however, how does your brass medallion on that handle read? I'm going to assume that it's a brass medallion that you have, right? I, I can show you, yeah, I can show you in one second, but keep talking, I'll take the left up to the saw. All right. Can you see that, um, that website? The last mark? brass medallions were made in the late 1940s, all right? And then going all the way back to the 1840s, they, were all, they all had some abbreviation of Philadelphia. Now read to me the abbreviation of Philadelphia along the, the South Hemisphere of that medallion. What, what kind of, read it out specifically. Let me know if it has any apostrophes. Uh, give me one second, I need to turn the light on. Just spell it out. T-H-I-L-A-D-A. -A. Philada, is there, okay, yeah. is there an apostrophe before that last A? I can't see it. Why don't you spit on it and rub it with your finger? Spitting and rubbing. <laughs> Spit and rub. I don't, you know what? I still don't see an apostrophe. Okay. If, but that could if be there one. there were, if there was a, an apostrophe before the A, that means the saw would have been made between 1887 and 1896. If there is no apostrophe, it was made between 1896 and 1917. So you have a turn of the last century saw. So it's a hundred year old saw that goes through six feet of 10 quarter oak in half an Probably hour. Probably 120 years old. Uh, it just boggles the mind. It looks like that handle is pretty complete too, right? There, I mean, there's a little chip at the very end. Here's mine. Yeah, well, yeah. This one has the apostrophe. This, this, this one was made late 1870s, early, I don't know, maybe, it could be earlier than, it could be earlier than, uh, 1887, but I doubt it. This, this is what I would consider an 1887 saw. And you can see the very fine contour of the handle. The more recently made saws have blockier handles. Uh, yeah, this no, this got out this... a rough form and then rasped carefully by a production guy on the production line with a rasp who cared about his yeah. work, you know? And uh, it's just amazing what they did. A little bit more trivia on how to date your saw. These are slotted nuts, all uh -huh. right, you can see them, right? Split nuts were generally phased out in the mid to late 1870s, right? Everybody loves split nuts, they look cool. But they deform easily and they're not that strong. Mm -hmm. um, I can't quote the technology, but I can say that turning equipment, it's a lathe, a type of lathe that turns screws. With the industrial revolution, as the 1870s progressed, got to the point where you could turn a slotted nut with a deeper barrel to receive more threads, which is stronger, right? Split nuts, you had just a few threads, they're kind of thin and they deform easily. As somebody like Mike Stemple will tell you, uh, don't ever remove the split nuts off a vintage saw, you'll just ruin them, all right? So uh, how to date your saw. Split nuts before 1876, say. Uh, slotted nuts sometime after 1870s, go to, uh, Eric von Snyder's website, DistonianInstitute.com, you'll get a very precise and frankly scholarly readout how to date your distance saw. Thank you. Yeah. Why saws? As I said in the beginning, OCD, army guy. All right. <laughs> I have a thing for uniformity, getting troops into formation. And you know what? There's something to be said for spending a few hours making something, test cutting it, and then going, wow, that just brought a smile to my face, right? Because we have all the troops in formation, they're properly kitted out, and man, that severs wood fiber better than any Japanese pole saw I've ever used, all right? So there it is, that's why saws, uh, the OCD part. Didn't wanna work for the man after I retired out of the army, went the entrepreneurial route. By then I'd already kind of figured out saw sharpening, <coughs> so I thought, there it is. I spent the first year uh, bad acts uh, before we began calling ourselves bad acts doing our, uh, our main, our business is actually techno primitives, LLC, doing business as bad acts tool works. Um, spent first year as techno primitives, disassembling, cleaning, sharpening, restoring, putting back together hundreds of vintage saws. And from that experience, 
gave me the foundation by which to design our saws, which are largely designed after distant, because the names that, that really stood out among anything else, one, were the old vintage saws. Why? Because they had the traditional folded saw back. You could take it off, you could adjust it, you could retention it. You can even tighten your handle with the traditional folded saw back. A lot of people just crank on the fasteners and ruin it. Actually, if you knock it back, since it's sprung onto the spine of the plate, knock it back toward the handle, make sure it's made it on the floor of the mortise in the handle that receives the plate back assembly, retention it, bingo. That's the cure for a loose saw handle, not tightening the fasteners. It also straightens out that tooth line uh, arrow straight. All right, kind of digress a little bit. Point I'm making is, is that after disassembling and putting back together hundreds of saws, started off on eBay, finally got about designing a website, hung my shingle, called myself a saw sharpener, got Chris Schwartz's attention to pipe through woodworking. He blogged about us. A week later, we had a dozen saws on our doorstep. Within the year, the kernel in me had kicked in and we began producing our own line of saws, bad axe saws, which the phonetics, of course, are not lost on the British who love asking me, Mark, when's my bad ass saw going to be ready? Now, actually, bad axe is a county in historical Wisconsin where I built the cabin 20 years ago. Bad axe county, site of the bad axe war of 1832. So there you have it. That's the story. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Mark, Mark, that's absolutely amazing. We, we did have Connor that wanted to ask, but I think Connor's had to leave now. So Connor, if you are watching this on playback, um, please look at the, um, the, you know, please give a comment in the YouTube video um, and, and ask uh, Mark a question, which I'm sure he'll answer in the comments uh, for that. Uh, but uh, Mark, um, absolutely fantastic. You've captivated us. Um, you, you know, I don't know what it is with these saw makers, but you know, this is meant to be an hour. And, uh, you, know, you know, we're an hour and a half um, and literally there's more people that want to keep going. So, Mark, you've absolutely done, done yourself proud. You've done Bad Axe proud. Um, and, and we are all in awe over your ability to, to be able to tell a story and to make a good saw. Thank you very much. Well, Mark. thank you so much. Sir Jeffrey, Derek, it's been my pleasure. Thank you all for attending. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Mark at badaxetoolworks.com. Happy to answer any remaining questions you may have. So the last thing is to toast to the bench. <laughs> to the bench. Mark Hurrell, thank you very much. Thank you Great all. Job, Mark. Thanks very much. To my British cousins. Indeed, yeah.